my value around what we need to do to secure our border. That value has not changed. Kamala Harris is hiding from media ever since her disastrous interview with a friendly reporter. The vice president has declined to answer media questions all throughout the campaign. And when she finally sat down for an interview, she was caught totally unprepared. This doesn't bode well for the vice president ahead of her debate with debate master Donald Trump next week. And meanwhile, Joe Biden appears to have entirely given up the facade and plans to live out his presidency somewhere on a beach in Delaware. We'll be discussing all that and more with True North columnist Sue Ann Levy. I'm Rachel Parker, and you're watching Rachel in the Republic. Hi, Sue Ann. Thank you for joining us again today. Welcome. So I wanted to take a look at discussing Kamala Harris and her and Tim Walz's recent interview. They've been pretty media shy, especially Kamala, because she's not very well spoken. She's not very eloquent. And of course, most importantly, they haven't actually put forward any policies. So they don't really have anything to talk about. They're hoping the campaign against Donald Trump is going to be one of vibes and one of optics. You know, they've made that very clear and they've essentially alluded to as much. Let's start by just playing this clip here of Kamala Harris. She was asked a pretty straightforward question. I think most Americans or most people who have any interest in politics would be able to come up with an answer to this question on their feet fairly quickly. But when Kamala Harris was asked a very basic question about how she plans to spend the first day of a presidency, she was caught pretty flat-footed. Take a look at this. Governor Walsh, thank you so much for sitting down with me and bringing the bus. The bus tour is well underway here in Georgia. You have less time to make your case to voters than any candidate in modern American history. The voters are really eager to hear what your plans are. If you are elected, what would you do on day one in the White House? Well, there are a number of things. I will tell you, first and foremost, one of my highest priorities is to do what we can to support and strengthen the middle class. Um, when I look at the aspirations, the goals, the ambitions of the American people, I think that um, people are ready for a new way forward um, in a way that generations of Americans have been fueled by, by hope and by optimism. I think sadly in the last decade um, we have had in the former president someone who has really been pushing an agenda and an environment that is about diminishing um, the character and the strength of who we are as Americans, uh, really dividing our nation. And I think people are ready to turn the page on that. So what would you do day one? Day one, it's going to be about, one, implementing my plan for what I call an opportunity economy. I've already laid out a number of um, proposals in that regard, which include what we're going to do to bring down um, the cost of everyday goods, what we're going to do to invest in America's small businesses, what we're going to do to invest in families, for example, extending the child tax credit to $6,000 for families for the first year of their child's life to help them buy a car seat, to help them buy baby clothes, a crib. Um, there's the work that we're going to do that is about investing in the American family around affordable housing, a big issue in our country right now. So there are a number of things on day one. So she's asked what she would do on day one. And instead of having a list of policies that she would put forward, she sort of lays out a vision, a vision she's talking about supporting the middle class, all these general things. Do you think that this is working for the Harris campaign? They've been doing this throughout the entire campaign. Or do you think that the American people are really starting to pick up on the lack of substance here? I certainly hope so, Rachel. I certainly hope so. You know, it, it, the thing that just really galls me is that they act like or she acts like she wasn't in power for the last three and a half years so what has she been doing for the last three and a half years to uh make life easier for the middle class in fact their bidenomics policies made prices go up so what is how is she going to bring them down and i i she talked about price gauging she actually got the word wrong it's price gouging of course and you know uh, they have been responsible for all of these prices, grocery prices. They just don't happen in isolation. Inflation was up and uh, the 
the cost to even buy oil, their decisions to cancel, for example, the Trans Canada Pipeline, and you know, a, get oil in their own neighborhood. I mean, they're dependent on Arab oil. I mean, I don't mean to get into this whole thing about oil, but the point is that they made decisions in the last three and a half years that impacted on the economy. And she's acting like she's just stepping into this role on day one. So I, I hate that duplicity. I just absolutely hate it. And when we talk we about her acting like she is just going to be jumping into this role on day one, I think the media has been pretty complicit in allowing her to get away with that lie. We even hear that question there from Dana. She says, do you have less time than any candidate in history to make your bid to the American people? Okay, sure, technically, um, maybe she's been the candidate, the Democratic presidential candidate for the least amount of time in history. But I mean, when we're really looking at this in, in fair terms, she's sort of been campaigning for the last four years. Um, and obviously she just doesn't have anything to show for her record. I, I was a little bit surprised to hear that question framed in that way, because I think the fact that she is in the vice president, she is the vice president, um, really does give her such an advantage if she had, you know, been actually doing things and passing favorable policy in, in her role as VP. You know, let's talk about the border for a minute. Okay. She, um, she and President Biden were responsible for undoing what Donald Trump did, the executive order that closed the border. So now they're talking about this ridiculous bill, when in fact, all they did was undo what he had done and allowed all these illegals to come across the border, many of whom are well, not many, but several have, you know, you've heard stories in Aurora, Colorado, about how these Venezuelan gangs have taken over an apartment building, how they're killing innocent people, they're unvetted. And, you know, she's talking about this border bill when in fact they had three and a half years to undo the damage they did by actually putting the executive order back in place. Fancy that, you know, uh, it's, it's, and the media is duplicitous in terms of allowing this to happen, not asking the right questions. I mean, the obvious question from Dana Bash would have been, should have been, if she was an honest journalist, um, you know, well, you did this in the last three and a half years. Why? Why can't you just step out the door in the next six months or uh, five months and undo and show us that you really mean what you say? Um, but you know, it looks like, as you said, there is no one running the country right now. It's actually very, very perturbing and very sad. Sure. And even sure. when you talk about the duplicity of the media here, I think the fact that was specifically on the topic of the border, the fact that they are not holding Kamala to her record as the borders are, there's more illegal aliens flooding the southern border in the states than ever before. A shocking number, absolutely concerning number. And, you know, now they're running cover for her saying that she was never actually the borders are because she never she never did anything on that. And it's an issue that's top of mind for any Americans that you talk to right now. Um, you know, Kamala, it's interesting because the media runs cover for the Democrats time and time again. We saw that very clearly when they announced that Kamala was going to be the candidate that Democrats were backing. She wasn't a very popular vice president. Even the media didn't really like her that much. And as soon as they said that she was going to be the presidential candidate, we saw a huge shift in the tone of the media to support her and to, you know, to back her up, run cover for her every possible opportunity. And she still is so bad at her job that she still can't find it in herself to take questions from them. I thought this clip from this week was so funny. Here she is. She's coming out of her car and she's walking <laughs> I know which one you're and she pretends to be on the phone to avoid taking questions from the reporters. But there's something incredibly funny that happens in this clip. We'll play it. We'll play it for you now. See if you can catch it before we point it out for you. <laughs> nothing, nothing says the call that I'm on is so important that in addition to having my headphones in, I also have to hold my phone up to my ear just to double make sure that I can hear what everyone's saying. Do, is anyone falling for this? Well, <laughs> I think what the uh, left wing media does is they don't report it. They pretend it didn't happen, but it, it, <laughs> 
<laughs> she is so inept she can't even can't even make a phone call. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What can I say? <laughs> but she. You know, um, go ahead, Suan. No, I'm just saying that the left wing media just com de deliberately avoids avoids it. Um, and I mean, even to the point where she went into Florida in the last couple of days where I have a home and which is real. Most park pockets are Republican country country. And she went into Florida and they show all these people. I don't know where they got these people. I wondered if they picked a few up from the, you know, the illegals from the border say, come, you'll make a few dollars, you know, but everything seems so phony, so generated the media talking about what a wonderful person she is when, you know, a month ago, she, they couldn't stand her. She was inept Joe Biden all the way, you know, he's fit to be president. Now he looks like he's going to keel over any minute. I mean, I don't understand how, like, I'm going to be blunt here, how stupid Americans can be to fall for all of this, the rah, rah, the joy, you know, the, <laughs> the, the, pretty words, the happy words, let me be clear. She has all these phrases. Have you, I mean, I've been listening to her night and day. I mean, probably too much. Uh, does her voice annoy you as much as it annoys me? That sort of, you know, elitist, nasally San Francisco voice? It's both nasally and monotone at the same time. I think I should probably refrain from making fun of anyone with a monotone voice because I'm very guilty of that myself. But yes, the the it it does get to you. You know, it's definitely a mind over matter thing when you're listening to that. I mean, I don't necessarily blame a lot of the American people. I think it's a shame that people still listen to so much mainstream media because that's where mm -hmm. they're being right. you know fed, fed these lies, and so that's quite unfortunate. But the fact that she is already sort of not wanting to answer questions. I mean, I think that this speaks to why the debate against Trump next week is so important because debates are actually one of those things that people do watch and it'll be a good opportunity for people to get a real sense of who she is. I mean, obviously debates are important. The last debate was so disastrous for the Democrats that they lost their presidential candidate mm -hmm. and, had to, and had to replace Joe Biden. And, and likewise in Canada, I think we can point to a number of debates. You know, in Alberta, the recent uh, general election last spring, um, well, I guess two springs ago now, technically, you know, it was it was neck and neck between the Alberta NDP and the Conservative Party in the province and the Alberta and, and Danielle Smith, a conservative candidate and the current premier, she had a stronger performance and she was able to pull ahead in the polls after that and eventually to form government. So I think that the debate is going to be so important, but because Kamala is such a bad, you know, she's such a bad speaker, she doesn't have a lot of policies to put forward. I mean, how are we going to see her position herself um, against Trump in a way that might allow her to have some success in the debate? Well, I fear, I really fear, you talk about the media, that ABC will give her a leg up and will do everything to try and um, spoon feed her whatever they, in whatever way they can, whether it be the questions, whether it be shutting Trump down, whether they make uh, snide remarks at him. Um, I don't know if you caught the uh, footage of her when she was debating Mike Pence a couple of years ago, where she kept saying, I'm speaking, I'm speaking, I'm speaking. I'm just praying that some of those things come out and the true nature of Kamala comes out uh, because I don't think she can help herself. I really don't. It's so ingrained. Um, but she is going to try very hard. You know, so she tried to change the debate rules so that the mics would be open so she could catch him into some, in some sort of comment that she would, you know, rear on her hind legs and go crazy about, uh, you know, you're sexist, you're thisist, you're whateverist, you know, I don't know if she's black or Indian, she'll, you know, she'll complain that he's racist. Um, but, you know, the mics thankfully are going to stay off. Uh, but she's going to try and get under his skin. That's the only tactic she has because she doesn't have policy. And she's going to accuse him of everything from being sexist to a convicted felon to this, this and that. And I think for Trump, the important thing is to stay on policy, to stay on, to show how destructive her policies have been and will be for America. Because I'm truly worried. I don't know about you, but I'm truly worried about what will happen to America with her in power.
Yeah, I think that you've kind of hit hit the nail on the head there. There was, um, so first and foremost, just to explain that a little further, the Harris campaign was sort of trying to goad Trump into agreeing to turn the mics on. So in the last debate against Joe Biden, basically when it wasn't a candidate's turn to speak, their mic was turned off. And a lot of pundits came out later on and said that that actually really benefited Trump because some of the off the cuff things he said, sometimes which can be very charming, sometimes can be very unfavorable in terms of, you know, a lot of people just don't like Trump's aggressiveness a lot of Americans are not sure about him. And so those remarks, you know, they weren't heard. And it also allowed Joe Biden to further embarrass himself because, you know, he was very incoherent in the debate. And so Trump wasn't heard speaking over him. And instead, you could actually hear Biden and, and the nonsense that he was rambling on about. So that sort of worked out very well. And I think the Harris campaign realized that now they're trying to go to Trump into turning the mics on. And he said, listen, I've agreed to do the debate with the exact same terms that I agreed to debate Biden again. So it seems like those mics um, will stay off, as you mentioned. Um, but you're right. And there was a leak um, from the Harris campaign this week. I'm sure it was intentional saying that basically they think the debate is going to be about optics. So there you see it again. They don't actually want to debate policy. They want to just talk about the vibe or the mood of the campaign. And I think you're right. There, she's really going to try to get under Trump's skin. And Trump was pretty good in the debate against Biden. There is a couple moments where he appeared to get a little rattled. And, and then, you know, he, he seemed to kind of catch himself. So if he can manage to remain calm, I think it'll be I think it'll be really good. But that's sort of all they have at this point. And, and to your point, you know, in the last debate with Harris against Pence, for people like you and me, we were watching it in, in those moments where she's like, I'm speaking, I'm speaking. You know, for any normal person, it was really irritating and it was sort of, you know, a, a abrasive to watch that. And you're just like, oh, like what an unlikable person. But I think those types of moments, like the, the raging left and the raging feminists, they love that stuff. I'm pretty sure there was t-shirts made about that moments, mugs, people lauded her for, for you know, asserting her her authority as a woman. And I think we're going to see that same thing happen against Trump where we're going to see her go after Trump and, and try to just really appear as like a, a strong feminist uh, uh, willing to go after Donald Trump. I think we're going to see a lot of that. You know, the, the thing is that uh, there's strong and there's assertive and there's aggressive and mean. And she falls into the second category, aggressive and mean. And she will use whatever she can uh, and the problem is that the media and the left interpret that as strength. It's not strength because she has nothing propping her up other than this, um, this kind of behavior. And it's, I think it speaks to her true character. Now, Trump is not lovable, but he did some tremendous good for the U.S. during his four years. And I think his, if I were advising, I would in the debate, remind people there were no wars. Israel wasn't at war. Ukraine wasn't at war. There was global peace. I got the Abraham Accords. Nobody was, you know, huge numbers weren't crossing the border. There were no rapes. There were no mur murders. Speak to people's fears to, of safety. And I think if he does that, he'll come off strong. Um, because, and, and I call her a mean girl. So if she exhibits that kind of behavior, the average person, that is going to grade on them. Mm -hmm. um, just the last thing I wanted to touch on here is Joe Biden. Does he even care that he's still president? I'm not sure if he will the best of the job. Take a look at this clip. Biden is once again just enjoying life on the beach in Del Delaware. I mean, in a way, watching him, you're like, you know, I don't really blame him. That looks really nice. I wish I was there right now. Mm -hmm. um, he's an old man. He's lived a long life. You know, his impairment's not there. He should be relaxing on a beach. All those things would be true if he hadn't run for pres the presidency in the last term. Obviously, he shouldn't have. He was too old. That became very clear. I just got to wonder who's running things over there at the White House right now. I ask this to a lot of my guests, get a lot of different answers. I'm, I'm just not sure who's in charge of the most powerful nation on earth right now. Administration, uh, the people you see who come on air, like Blinken, Secretary of State Blinken, and some of the others, he's not in charge. He said that while he was on the beach, he obviously, I can't see him. He's kind of holding his phone, but I don't think he's on it. He was regularly in touch with Netanyahu, 
Benjamin Netanyahu, the uh, Prime Minister of Israel. Um, and, <laughs> you know, that's not happening. It's, it's, and people have said, speculated that he's really deteriorated. He just gave another speech when he came off the beach and that he's deteriorated even further that he was slurring his words. So uh, I think he's, he's toast and he should have stepped aside for the next five months. I mean, that is all hubris. That is all ego. And that's not fair to, uh, well, what was once the world superpower, no longer under these people. Bureaucrats are in charge of uh, of the American of the American government. What a chilling thought that is. Mm -hmm. Suanne, thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, everyone. That's all we have for you today on Rachel and the Republic. We'll be back next week with coverage of the Trump versus Harris debate. I cannot wait to watch it. I'm sure that you're all very excited as well. See you next week. Have a good one. God bless.